Welcome. Good to see all of you here today. Welcome, welcome. Looking forward to talking about life purpose. It's actually been a topic I've always been fascinated by, so. Hi, Mark. Looks like you're traveling. Sounds great. Silver City, New Mexico. Just give it a couple minutes. Hi, Karen. Miss seeing you in person. I hope you're well. Hi, Brenda. <clears throat> Hope everyone's doing well. We met a month ago and uh, we talked about sort of this cross quarter point between winter and spring. Um, and we talked about the need just to keep resting. Like you have one, one eye looking forward, but one high sort of like staying in the energy of winter. And now we're going full force, right? <laughs> now we're we're moving closer and closer to spring. So we're going to talk about life purpose, which is the path of action. And so I'm hoping that today's conversation sort of matches up with the energy of the season and what's going on. So hi, Terry from Pella. Hi, Darlene from Pennsylvania. Hi, Margaret from California. We got all kinds of states represented. So let's dive in so we can use our whole time. So I do watch the chat. You'll see me kind of go back and forth. So please, um, yes, and dear Kathy, one of my uh, favorite and deep teachers from Rhode Island. I love that you're here too. And Joe's from the UK, beautiful. Um, so let's dive in. What I was saying is you can see how I get, <laughs> I get sidetracked by that chat box, but please put in questions, comments, um, depending on when I'm done, I'd love to spend extra time um, answering questions or if you have thoughts. People also read the chat box, so know that what you share really amplifies the message. And you all here have tons of wisdom, so add it, right? Like, let's collectively keep bringing all this wisdom together to help each other during these times that are continue to be challenging, so... Okay, let me pull up where we're headed today. So we are working with purpose, life meaning. Uh, the yogis call it dharma. So this is where we're going to spend our time together. For those of you who are new, these are many of the roles that I um, live in. Not the whole of me, but some of the things that I do. And in light of talking about Dharma life purpose, I really feel like one of my life purposes, I wouldn't say the only one, but one is really working with the two disciplines, my two loves, psychology and yoga, and integrating what would be pretty modern Western science uh, with a much more ancient perspective. And I feel like when you bring the two together, there's a lot of powerful wisdom for all of us about how to live um, just a more contented, um, happier life. Lots of things going on. Uh, you can join me for Wisdom Wednesdays. You can join me for free Saturday yoga, do a podcast. I'm going to be offering a class for the highly sensitive because I'm one of them, uh, proudly one of them. I have learned over the years how to manage it. It's not always easy. So we're going to do uh, probably a four or five week online class about being highly, a highly sensitive person and or maybe even an empath. Um, I've got a retreat coming up in Ireland. There's still a couple spots if anyone wants a big adventure. And then my signature course is Yoga for the Mind, where I take yoga and psychology and we work with the integration of them. Um, it's geared towards yoga teachers, mental health professionals, and then a, you know, a real serious student who wants to learn more uh, philosophy and how it applies to life. Okay, here's what we're doing. And talk about purpose, the science behind it, how we discern it, why we got to find our own purpose and not rely on copying someone else's. And then the one thing that all of our dharmas have in common, even though we each have a unique one, we have one, there's one sort of sliver of truth that um, shows up in everyone's. So the question we're exploring is what I consider what my teacher 
and give all the credit to my teacher, Dr. Deepak Chopra. He, I've been lucky enough to do my meditation training with him. I've gone out to study with him on several separate occasions. And in the style of meditation he teaches, he encourages people to start every meditation with these four soul questions. So these are really the big questions of life. These are the questions that there clearly is not one answer to. And um, I've been asking myself these four soul questions every day for probably about the past eight or nine years in my own meditation practice. And the answers are different. And sometimes I'm surprised at what my soul or my psyche pulls to the forefront for me when I ask these questions. You don't have to spend a lot of time with it. Just pose the question, see what comes through. So question number three is where I'd like to spend some of our time together. Like, what is my purpose? Why am I here on this earth? What is it about this moment in history on this planet that my soul decided to incarnate in this body? What is it all for? Big question. So this is where we're going to go. Um, in the yoga tradition, and I think one of the reasons I was so drawn to yoga and the whole philosophy and history behind it is it filled in some of the blanks for me that I didn't get in my Western psychological PhD program. It talked about deeper spiritual things that I was longing to learn about. I was looking in the research and the data for and I couldn't find. And so the, the idea of life purpose the yogis call it dharma, and they actually have a very detailed methodology for how to find it and then how to implement it. So when I learned this in my study of yoga, I was like, wow, this is exciting. And it's so applicable. That's the thing I'm always blown away by is this very old thousand, 2000, 3000 year old system still has so much meaning to modern times. So the way that dharma is actually defined it can dharma in the in the yogic tradition can mean really a lot of things um it can be defined as teaching as law as our sacred duty as our path but probably the meaning that most resonates with me is it's our truth so it's just simply the truth of our essence of our being right it's our truth it's not anyone else's truth it's our truth and that's pretty exciting to know that a we have one and be that we can discern it. Now, where people get very thrown off is that people often believe our life purpose. And as I have kind of been perusing some of the, you know, YouTube videos on life purpose, it's often really geared towards this is my career. This is my job path. And it's key to understand that your dharma may show up in your work life, but it doesn't necessarily have to. It's rather, it's just our truth. It's what brings us meaning in our life. And Viktor Frankl, um, most of you probably have heard of Viktor Frankl, psychiatrist who was in Auschwitz and spent, I believe, three years in Auschwitz and was one of the lucky ones to survive. He arrived at Auschwitz with a manuscript that he had been working on years and years and years. And he handed it to one of the guards and said, would you keep this safe? I want to make sure that I can publish this someday. And it was early on in his time at Auschwitz and, and the guard sort of looked at him with a sort of face of pity. Like, I don't think you understand what this is all about here. Of course, he never saw the manuscript again, but one of the things that kept him alive during these years in the concentration camps is he had this message. He had this driving desire to get um, his words, his ideas out into the world. And he later, after he, um, his, his wife, his children were killed in Auschwitz. But as he was released, he um, even created a, a style of psychotherapy called logotherapy. But he really... Uh, figured out through his experience that there seems to be four things that give people meaning. And the first one is synchronicity, right? So synchronicity is a term that Carl Jung um, uh, came up with. It's this idea that it's things that happen and they line up and we're in the right place at the right time, or the sign shows up, the symbol shows up. 
So this can give people a lot of meaning. And Viktor Frankl had many of these moments of synchronicity um, in the camp that gave him the hope that there was something larger going on and that he had a reason to stay alive. The second thing is meaningful work. So see of this list of four, yeah, work is something that gives people purpose, but it's not the only thing. Uh, the third thing is the people we love. And Viktor Frankl had no idea during his time there what had happened to his, women, his wife and children, but just his love for them and his belief that he would see them someday is again, the drive that he had in him to stay alive. And then last but not least, I, I'm really actually moved by this that he believed that the people that were most able to face their suffering in that camp also were the ones who stayed alive. So his perspective was it's not um, starvation or difficult conditions per se that made the decision as to who would stay alive and who would die, but he could see that people would lose hope. They would lose meaning. They would lose a reason to go on. And uh, that would be their downfall in terms of uh, sort of giving up. So I think this ties into this conversation, even though I'm not going to go any deeper into Viktor Frankl's work today, that your dharma is your truth. So it may look like meaningful work. It may look like love for friends and family. It may look like this just showed up in my life and I'm going to do it, that synchronicity um, or it may be you're in really in a space of suffering and working through that suffering is what your purpose is. What we know is that there are so many benefits to um, discerning your purpose and then living it out fully. Um, and this is the, the current data on this, the current research. First and foremost, it's a buffer for stress. So it doesn't mean that people who have purpose have less stress. In fact, sometimes they have more stress according to the research, but they don't seem to be as impacted negatively by the stress. So this is fascinating. It's like when we have a life purpose, it gives us a bigger picture for life. And somehow having that eagle view allows us to move through the day in, day out challenges because we have this bigger vision of why we're here, what we're doing. Uh, similar to what Viktor Frankl figured out, purpose somehow um, seems to promote longevity. It helps us stay alive. Um, it also is related to lower, slower rates of cognitive decline, less Alzheimer's. And then this last one, which I really like, it makes you more likable. So there was a great study done um, looking at people who had a specific life purpose. And it seems as if people rate their likability higher. It's as if we're all drawn to somebody who has a, a very clear, distinct purpose. They know why they're here and they're going for it. So there's something about pursuing our unique path that really uh, draws people to us potentially. And on, on top of these signs, because I like to have one foot in the science world and one foot in the more esoteric world, my esoteric foot would say, and it's funny, I'm saying this on my right side, it probably should be on my left side. My esoteric foot is my left one and my, um, based on mind body medicine and what the left and right sides of the body represent, but I'm digressing. So what the yogis say about purpose is that when we find our purpose, we set ourselves up for fulfillment, for contentedness, and for happiness. And that's our uh, primary path to those things is through living out our purpose. So clearly the yogis are saying it's essential to your well-being to be able to um, discern your purpose and live your purpose. So how do we do that? I mean, let's, I think this is the big one. And what I will say is, um, you know, everyone faces this question and we all face this question sometimes multiple times throughout a lifetime. So I want you to know you don't figure out your Dharma at 23 and then boom, you got it made for the rest of your life. Dharma shifts and changes based on our life chapters. And so oftentimes at transition points, Right? When we're leaving a job or we're changing a relationship or we're graduating, this is when this big question comes up of like, what is my purpose? 
So as I said earlier, the yogis had sort of a methodology for how do we discern this? And what they talk about is that there's sort of two ways for us to really discern our higher mind or our wisdom, that there's two pathways that will take us to being tuned into our intuition so that we can discern what our path is. And the first uh, path is the being mode. And this is actually what I talked about in our last Wisdom Wednesday. I talked a lot about the power of rest. And so we know that in these spaces of being, where we're actually resting, we're um, in a contemplative state, right? Like meditation or hypnosis. And this is when the mind gets really quiet. And this is often when we can start to discern what our truth is, what our path is. So this is one way is to be in a state of being. Now, the other possibility of sort of being with the deepest part of yourself, the wise part of yourself is called the path of action, the path of doing called Dharma. So it's required of us that we actually get going. <laughs> we don't stay in meditation all day. We get up and we take action. And that action is motivated by this deeper sense of purpose. Now, I don't believe, you know, I put up a picture here where it looks like you have to decide. I actually think you need both of these paths that often we have to sit in quiet contemplation to get clear on who we are, what we need, what we desire, just like those four soul questions. I don't ask them during a middle, the middle of a busy work day. I ask them when I'm sitting down to meditate, to be still. So the, the being aspect is necessary, but once we get some clarity, and even if we don't have full clarity, what's still required of us is to take action. Now, the yogis say just like an acorn has the DNA within it to grow into a massive oak tree, each of us have an inner blueprint. We each have a, we might call our own sort of inner DNA that is trying to guide us towards what our life purpose is, why we're here, the higher aspect of ourself. So I want to allay any fears that you can somehow miss your dharma. Just like a acorn is programmed to turn into an oak tree, we have the programming within us to turn into why we're here. So People are often in great fear and anxiety that somehow they've missed their purpose. You might be slightly a couple degrees off of it, but there really in many ways, it's, it's hard to fully miss your purpose because it's so ingrained in the, the depths of who you are. But often we have no clue and we get stuck. We sort of spin. So this is often where people end up. And believe me, I've seen a fair amount of people in my practice. Like I don't know what to do. I'm stuck. I, I will, I've also will admit that I've been in stuck patterning various times in my life. And I am someone who actually has a hard time with decision-making. And so I will stay in <laughs> sort of the swirling, circling for a long, long time, going through all the different possibilities. But deciding to do nothing is a decision in and of itself. So this is sort of this concept. If I can't figure out what to do, I'm just going to do nothing. And I want to play a little clip from the movie, The Graduate, because I know you all <laughs> maybe remember this movie, but I love this clip. Okay, so we're just going to go. Ben, what are you doing? Well, I would say that I'm just drifting here in the pool. Why? Well, it's very comfortable just to drift here. Have you thought about graduate school? No. Would you mind telling me then what those four years of college were for? What was the point of all that hard work? You got me. Now, listen, Ben. All right. I think that's enough for us to get... <laughs> The gist of, and I love this scene, is called drifting, right? So we've all been drifting at various times in our life where we're just like, I'm, I'm just drifting. I'm just going to stay here and do nothing. And 
this absolutely is a normal human experience. Absolutely, absolutely. But there comes, and by the way, it doesn't hit just the bins of the world, right? The people who've just graduated from college, living at home saying, what am I going to do next? I don't know. I'm just going to hang out here in the pool for the summer. I see it a lot in middle age, right? Where life has become very tedious. We're on the same pathway. We're doing the same thing day in, day out. What is my purpose? What is the meaning of this? I've worked hard for this house and this job, but I have no sense of deeper meaning. And then I also see it a lot at transition points out of our career. So people who've retired, in fact, I just had someone recently say to me, um, who's a retiree, I just feel like I don't have any purpose anymore. There's such a void, there's such an emptiness. So it hits all ages, all stages, this sense of, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to do nothing. So this takes me to the Bhagavad Gita. And ironically, this book that you may have read in college, perhaps, or may have read it more recently, um, it's really a 2,000-year-old conversation about life purpose. And even the main uh, person, Arjuna, in the Bhagavad Gita is just like good old Ben in the pool. <laughs> saying, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to do nothing. So the Bhagavad Gita is a portion of a larger text called the Mahabharata, which is what George Lucas um, used as the basis for Star Wars. So it's got, a, it's got a lot of juice in it. And the Bhagavad Gita was also the book that um, Gandhi, the only book that Gandhi supposedly took to prison, and one of the few books that Henry David Thoreau took to Walden Pond. So we could say it's got some credibility, this Bhagavad Gita. And when I have had the chance to study with several teachers and sort of depth workshops on the Bhagavad Gita, and every time I come back to it, uh, there's new layers that come out. So we could talk for weeks on the Bhagavad Gita. I'm going to specifically just talk very briefly about this core idea of life purpose. So I want to, and many of my thoughts and some of the teachings I'm giving today, this when people say, what's your favorite Bhagavad Gita? This one, the Juan Mascaro translation is my favorite translation of it. And then my favorite book about the Bhagavad Gita. Gita is Stephen Cope's amazing book. I could read this book over and over, The Great Work of Your Life. It's truly um, such a profound book, and um, I highly recommend it to anyone who's curious about this topic. So just to give you a setup of this 18-chapter classic, the Bhagavad Gita, I just want to set the stage for sort of this epic story and it's the story of Arjuna, who is the great warrior. He's the handsome soldier and his charioteer. So um, the man who's driving the chariot. So the picture on the right is uh, Arjuna with his hand on his head because he's essentially having um, what I call this huge panic attack <laughs> because he's looking at the battle that is before him. You know, they're preparing for battle and he is the greatest warrior. Everyone knows you are the great warrior. But the reason he's having such a colossal moment of anxiety is he's looking to who he's gonna come in battle with. And as he looks at the other side, he notices his teachers over there and his uncle and his cousins and old friends. And he realizes that he's going to be asked to fight and potentially kill people that he loves, people who've had a profound impact on his life. So not only will this battle be a breakdown for the community he's fighting for, but it's the breakdown of his family. So he's clearly in massive conflict as all of us would be. Well, lucky enough, Arjuna's charioteer driver, his name is Krishna. He actually happens to be God, although Krishna doesn't learn this until many, many chapters in. So he's getting good, av good advice, essentially. He's getting really wise counsel. And so basically, it's the story of Krishna, God, giving guidance to Arjuna about how do you discern your life purpose? How do you figure it out? 
How do you step up to it? How do you engage with it? And really what the Bhagavad Gita, for, Bhagavad Gita is, it's a metaphor for our life, just as all great stories are. It's a, um, I think it's really symbolic of the fact that we all fight battles. We all fight these internal battles within ourselves where um, neither option feels good to us, right? Like, I don't want to go this direction, but I don't want to go this other direction either. They both feel horrible. I'm having a really hard time seeing the good in either direction. So I'm just going to do nothing. And that's what Arjuna is doing. He's like, I just want to stay on the floor of this chariot and do nothing. I can't make a decision. This is too hard. Anybody relate to this? So as we go through the Gita, the four main teachings, and these really are so beautifully laid out again by Stephen Cope in that book, The Great Work of Your Soul. Um, the first teaching is you have to look to your dharma. So this is what this whole conversation is about today. We have to figure out what is my purpose? Why am I here? What is it all about? So this, this slide here is sort of the core because I think this is the big question. If I know how to do my dharma, great, but what is it? How do I discern it? And I do believe it is something that can be cultivated as does the author um, at the bottom of this slide, Burrow and Hill, who've written this book called The Ecology of Purpose, Purposeful Life Across the Lifespan. These three things, how to cultivate it, come from that book. But then what I've done is taken my interest in study of the Bhagavad Gita, and they line up perfectly, of course, because this is what I've learned so much in my years of working in, in psychology, Western science, and the ancient traditions, that they line up. They, of course, because this is all deep wisdom. So the first way we figure out our dharma is we have to sustain our attention. So the questions you might ask yourself are, what things light me up? Where do I put my time? What could I just do for hours on end without losing focus? Each of us has a really unique gift. And we don't know why. So we don't know why these gifts come to us. We don't know why we're especially adept at basketball. Or when we started music, we just knew how to play with a lot of depth and feeling. I know when I started to teach yoga, it felt um, like I had done it before and I couldn't understand that. I'm like, why do, why do I know these things that I maybe have never even studied? Why is this coming and flowing in, in such a, I don't want to call, say that it was an effortless manner, but it, it felt like I knew some of this before I knew it, if that makes sense. So we each come in with these unique gifts and the gift isn't necessarily your dharma, what you do with the gift or how you manifest or how you use the gift in the world, we could say is the dharma. But the reason figuring out our dharma is so important is that only us, only our unique thumbprint can complete our task in this lifetime. Right? We each have something specific to give. And for any of you who have looked maybe at the playing field of, let's say you're a writer and you're like, well, why would I write that book? There's six of them out there with the same topic. Well, you write the book because you have a unique perspective on it. Even if someone has already talked about the Bhagavad Gita, you have a whole nother viewpoint on it that the world might need to hear or some people in the world might need to hear. So there's this piece of us acknowledging we have a unique viewpoint, we have a unique gift, and our job is to bring it to the world in service. Now, if we copy someone else's gift and just start to do that in the world, that actually, according to the Bhagavad Gita, brings extreme spiritual peril. So this is why it's so important for us to discern what is my unique gift, not can I take someone else's gift and copy it and then bring it to the world. Um, I've told this story before, but I, I remember sitting at a bar waiting for a table at a restaurant and I was talking to the person next to me who happened to be um, 
a gynecologist. And as we talked, he shared with me that his father had been a gynecologist and his father had been the only person who delivered babies in his region. And he was a hero in the town and everyone loved it, loved him. And so this man, you know, I was reading between the lines, but this man wanted to be like his father. But what was very clear to me in the 10 minutes that I talked to this man is he was miserable. He was following his father's path and not his own path. He was doing what he saw his parent do to bring, I mean, clearly his father was in sort of alignment with his truth, but it wasn't this man's truth because I could feel uh, the unhappiness uh, just sort of, you know, coming off of him. And I've always taken that example as sort of this idea that if we um, follow someone else's dharma, the exact quote from the Bhagavad Gita is, it is better to fail at your own dharma than to succeed at the dharma of someone else. The attempt to live out someone else's dharma brings extreme spiritual peril. So the necessity of finding our own unique vantage point is so key. All right, so one way we cultivate our dharmas, we look to what I want to give a lot of attention to and sort of I follow that. The second thing is more of a reactive pathway, meaning something big happened, something really challenging happened. Maybe there was a major trauma growing up that then uh, put you on a path to learn about that. Or maybe you had a childhood illness, which made you want to become a researcher to study that illness. So a lot of people's dharmas come out of something very challenging that forced them to address it and to work with it. And if you remember one of the four things that Viktor Frankl said brings meaning is addressing our own suffering. So when we address our own suffering, this often can move into our dharma. And then the third thing is social awareness. And this one I think is really important for people who are struggling with what is my purpose? Well, look to what's going on around you. What is the call of the times? What is the pain and suffering that's happening around you? What is needed from you? Who is asking for your help, right? So we too often get this vision. And again, I think sort of our pop psychology, you know, influencers saying, let me help you find your life path. Um, it's this belief that when we find our life path, it's going to bring us fame, fortune, notoriety, power. Um, and Dharma, according to Bhagavad Gita and sort of this deeper wisdom to tradition, it's not, it's never about that. Dharma is always about service, right? So if you are in service, this is, this is the path. And so sometimes the smallest, what appear to be the smallest things are the biggest things because they are in service. So if you, again, are trying to figure out what is my purpose, look to what is being, what are you being asked to do around you? What is being needed around you? Can you step up and um, dilute some of the misery that is around you? All right, the second teaching of the Gita is do it at full. Right. So when you get clear, even if you're not fully clear, you still show up and you act. Right. So as Stephen Cope says in his book, you got to learn to unify. Right. You have to start to figure out what you are here to do and then do it on purpose, which means you got to let some things fall away. You have to say no to certain things. Um, in fact, Stephen Cope says, as he was writing his book, he realized this is my purpose right now. So he had to say no to a lot of other great offers, a lot of great parties and invitations and vacations, because he knew my purpose is to get this book done and published. So you have to kind of, you know, hone in and then really do it. And sometimes it may mean that you also have to put in practice. Right. Mastery is never the result of mere talent. It is talent plus the work and the effort, the sustained effort that goes into it. So sometimes when we figure out, all right, I'm meant to do this, but I have a lot to learn. We have to be willing to put in our time. 
third teaching, this is a good one, but this is such a hard one for so many of us. We have to let go of the fruits, meaning we show up, we do our service in the world, we do our truth in the world, but we have to detach from what anybody thinks around it. And even if we're getting all kinds of positive feedback, can we detach from that? If we're getting negative feedback, can we detach from that? So you give yourself entirely to the work, but you let go of the outcome. Again, I'm not saying this is an easy one. I think this is perhaps one of the hardest ones because we're all so conditioned to look to the external world. Am I doing okay? Am I doing the right thing? Is this the right path? Um, that was my story, right? I had a really hard time making decisions. So um, I've had to learn over the years that I'd go to people. Is this right? Do you think this is okay? Should I do this? Should I not do this? Instead of really trusting that inner voice going in. So if we are anchored into that internal space, then we can do our dharma in the world with less concern about how it looks or how it shows up, how it lands for other people. And then a final teaching, of course, there are more than four. There are so many teachings in the Bhagavad Gita, but is to trust the process. So at one point near the end of this uh, powerful story, Arjuna, the warrior, says to Krishna, God, I forget. I forget who I am. Krishna, help. How do I maintain this fragile connection to my truth? So I keep forgetting who I am. I keep forgetting what I'm here to do. How do I maintain this fragile connection to the truth? And what Krishna tells him is so beautiful. He says, Arjuna, this is why I have given you your dharma. Your dharma is your way of staying connected with your true nature. It is the particular way in which you can devote your life to the welfare, welfare of all beings. Your dharma is your own way of expressing the truth. Don't you see your dharma is your path home? So beautiful. So how do we trust the process? How do we sort of, you know, because we, we think our dharma is this, but of course we're like, is this right? got doubts. Am I doing the right thing with my life? Am I doing enough? Am I helping enough? Right? And so the truth here is, or the, the teaching is your dharma is your way of staying connected to yourself, your true nature, your inner truth. It is your path home. And again, what is dharma? Dharma is not sitting in silence. Dharma is taking action. It's being in the world. It's stepping up. It's doing your thing. It's figuring out how you can serve. So let me ask you all, how do you think the story ends? And by the way, if you know how the story ends, you're not allowed to put it in the chat box. <laughs> don't, don't, don't share the secret. So essentially, does Arjuna stay in the chariot? Does he stay stuck on the floor of the chariot? I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to stay on the couch and watch Netflix. Does he make peace? Does he figure out a, a way to create peace between these two sides? Or does he fight? Does he go into battle? I got to get out of here because I want to see what y'all say. And again, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to uh, answer. <laughs> yeah, Doug, that's a good, that's a good thought. Before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Yeah. So what do you think? Does he, does he fight? Does he create peace? Maybe you're like, we know, Betsy, we know this story. Well, when I first learned about this and I learned that he chose to fight, I was mad. I was like, how is this learned man who's been engaging with God, how is he going to go kill his teacher and his uncle, right? And of course, the purpose behind it is he's following his dharma. His dharma, yes, Mark, his dharma is a warrior. He's a warrior. He's meant to be a warrior. He's meant to be in battle. This is his purpose. This is his life purpose. The deal is none of us know the bigger, larger reasons of why 
life unfolds the way it is, which is why Dharma is so important that we're connected to our purpose and we do it out full. We follow, we trust the process, right? Detaching from, you know, any kind of um, feedback about what others believe is right or wrong. So yes, Arjun, of course, he's a warrior. He keeps fighting. All right, so to sum this up, I have two more slides. Here's your final encouragement, whether you're questioning your own life purpose or you have questioned it or you're in some kind of transition. Your dharma, your truth, your purpose, it is encoded in you. You don't have to look far. <laughs> it's in there, right? You cannot miss it. And it seems to be discerning it comes from that quiet meditative space coupled with a willingness to go out and take action, to follow up on uh, doing, you know, showing up in the world. Another piece here is that our dharma, again, it's not set. And then I guess I take that back. It's probably unique for everyone. For some people, they might realize their dharma is this and they're going to play it out. But for most of us, dharma will morph and change throughout a lifetime. So the dharma you're enacting at 23 may look very different than the dharma you're enacting at 53. But it seems that there tends to be some deeper theme that sort of ties it all together throughout a lifetime. So maybe one of your theme is, uh, is healing your own suffering. And so healing your own suffering, suffering shows up as service in lots of different ways in lots of different situations throughout the course of your lifetime. Um, but but know that it's okay for it to change. So yeah, when you get to retirement, you might really be questioning, what is my purpose? My guess is if you really look back over what your purpose has been up until that point, there are some clues about what this new sort of shift in Dharma will look like. Key point, it's all about service. Dharma, our life purpose, our chance for contentment, our chance for um, deep happiness, according to the Bhagavad Gita, is based in service. We are here, um, as it's been said, I think, by Ram Das to walk each other home, right? We are here to help each other. Life is not easy. It's not shiny. It's not um, beautiful all the time. It's really challenging. So we're here for each other. We're here to be in service. It's unique to you. So you got your own personal thumbprint. Yeah, there are thousands of yoga teachers out there, but the way you do it is different, or there are thousands of authors out there, but you, the way you're going to write is different. So um, it is unique. Your perspective is unique. And last but not least, you got to get off the couch and go for it. You got to do it. So this last quote, um, I learned this years and years ago, and it's it continues to stay with me. So the plain fact is that the planet does not need more successful people but it does desperately need more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of every kind. It needs people who live well in their places. It needs people of moral courage, willing to join the fight to make the world habitable and humane. And these qualities have little to do with success as we have defined it. Yep, we've all been fed the idea that money, power, success as we've defined it is, you know, the key. And, you know, hopefully this conversation today has helped us see, you know, we're here to, to, to help, to be of service. All right, questions, anyone? Uh, I see the question, the Bhagavad Gita translation I like best is Juan Mascardo, M-A-S-C-A-R-D-O. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being a part of Wisdom Wednesdays. I'll stand for a couple of minutes if anyone has questions. And we will, this will be up on YouTube, by the way by the end of the day. So if um, there's someone in your life who you feel like might benefit from hearing these messages, I hope it's a hopeful one because sometimes we can feel so lost in why am I here? What am I doing? My life is meaningless. Um, just to know that it's in us, you know, we can't like, we can't lose it. It's always there. 
um, is really so helpful. Yeah. This is a great question, Jan. How do you continue to fight the nagging I'm not doing enough? Oh my goodness, how I relate to that question, Jan. Um, I think that's a part of this culture that we've all been raised in, which is a very you know capitalistic, moving, going, doing, very um, uh, focused on production. And so I do come back to those two paths. What's the path to wisdom and knowledge? Yes, action is one of them. But the being, doing is one, but being is the other one that brings us wisdom and knowledge. So it's a hard fight for me because I definitely have been conditioned into do, 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 go, 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 accomplish, check things off the list. And what I'm learning as I get older and older is that the being part is as essential, the resting, the meditative, the taking breaks, the doing nothing, daydreaming letting a weekend float by. This is just as important. So how do you fight the nagging I'm not doing enough? My guess is that you're doing more than enough. And what if you added in more being, right? Um, which I think is is really hard, um, but possible. Um, Mark, what's in store for next month's Wisdom Wednesday? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the ideas just kind of come in and then I, I follow and listen. Um, but I would be up for any recommendations or things that you guys would like to explore, but I don't know yet. I, I'm, I'm not, not there yet. Thanks everyone for your kind comments. Mm, Kathy, this is a great question, and I'll take a moment to, to attempt to express it uh, or answer or at least bring forth some ideas. It would be helpful to hear or see some examples of how people describe their dharma. Do you have examples? Yeah. I'm going to use, uh, let me see if my mom is on this call. Mom, are you on here? My aunt, her sister's on this call. Um, yeah, she's on the skull. So uh, my mom and I, I think we've maybe talked about this. I wrote about it in a chapter that I wrote. Um, and again, we can hold multiple dharmas, but I feel like one of my mom's most beautiful dharmas is that she has a way of writing very nurturing and kind words to people. So my mother is a, and always has been, as long as I can remember, a very uh, potent letter writer. So she does not miss people's anniversaries, birthdays, and she always will write a sympathy card. And it's not just a, a card with a signature. It is like a well thought out, handwritten note to people. Um, I cannot even probably begin to think about how many people my mom has touched with her, her words, her letters that she sends to people. So you could call this a dharma, right? This could call this a life purpose that she uses her skill of knowing just what to say when someone is really in a hard place. She also has the most beautiful penmanship of anyone I've ever met. She's, it's just like, it's like art. So she writes these beautiful handwritten letters, right? With beautiful stamps. And, and it is like a piece of, it's a deep gift and it's a piece of like therapeutic offering to people. So this is a, this is an example of a Dharma. And of course she has other paths that she's also fulfilling. So that would be one, that's one example that I have thought about and written about. I also think a Dharma can be, um, I like to nourish people. And so how you nourish people can look different at different phases in life. Your nourishment might look like cooking huge meals that you put on a big table and your whole neighborhood shows up. And you're always the cook who cooks for Easter and Thanksgiving and holidays, right? So there's usually a, a, a deeper, a, 
another Dharma is a healer, right? And so in third grade, you were healing your friends and being the listener. And then it turned into you being a nurse, which then when you retired, it turned into you volunteering at, you know, a school, right? So there's usually a, a deeper life purpose, you know, and, and actually I think Victor Frankl's four really makes sense, right? So it's facing your own suffering and sometimes doing your own internal healing work becomes your dharma. I feel like that's one of my dharmas as I have sort of done my internal healing work, then that has led to me sharing it with other people. Another one is loving others. So your dharma might be, I am in service to all of these loved ones around me. You know, that might be what dharma looks like. It could be your job. I mean, some people have a deep dharma of I'm just a teacher. I was born a teacher. And so yeah, it looks like coaching in college. It looks like being a, a school teacher during my career, but now I'm retired and now I'm teaching an art class, right? So these are some of the deeper themes, but again, it can morph and change. And so you might see this chapter of my life. This was my Dharma. Then I moved and I really transformed and now I have a different Dharma, but those are some examples. Again, Dharma isn't, I'm the CEO of a company. That CEO is Dharma might be, I have uh, a deep capacity to be able to see numbers and how they work and how we can, you know, make it so that more people can receive this product, right? Just making these things up. But these are all potentials of what Dharma looks like. Margaret just started to read the Bhagavad Gita last night. That is synchronicity, Margaret. That's amazing. Yeah, Nancy, that the teaching that we cannot follow anyone else's dharma is so important, right? We got our own. We got our own. What would you recommend to start the exploration of your own dharma? I would get that Stephen Cope book and read it because he talks about lots of famous examples. He talks about Harriet Tubman, right? He talks about, I think, uh, Henry Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau. So he sort of takes historical people's lives and helps you see how they were born with this dharma. They developed this dharma. They stepped into it. And the theme of their life purpose sort of showed up in various ways throughout their life. It's such a good read. So I would start with that one. Will there be a tent her program this summer? Most likely, Julie, working on it. I'm a human being, not a human doing. Teresa, thanks for that. Brene Brown from the wise Brene Brown. Margaret, you do want a letter from my mother. It's a special thing for that to arrive in the mail. Mm-hmm. All right. Any other thoughts, questions before we sign off? Thanks everyone for being here today. We had close to 90. So lots of people interested in life purpose. You can't get it wrong. Just get out there and take some action. All right. Lots of love to you.